that, let's uh, go to Lord in prayer as we get into today, and we're in like a f- part four of a six-week series, so we're just over halfway through today. But Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives and teaching us about the overflow, God. And I pray that today, as we study the overflow of your provision, God, it would just open our eyes to just how you move in our lives and how you provide for us, God, uh, even in unexpected ways. And so may your spirit lead and guide us today, and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, I really hope and pray that throughout this series, you've been getting a lot out of this series. I know I have. Uh, personally, as I've studied and prepared each week for these things, one of the things I kind of find interesting is as I approach a series, uh, I kind of have an idea of how maybe the messages might go, and then I get studying it, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> it doesn't go that way. <laughs> and like God shows me all kinds of new and cool insights and shows me something different. And today, uh, honestly, this is one of those that, that kind of just opened my eyes to see things in a different way. And it's, it has to do with the overflow of God's provision and how God provides for us. And so, you know, let me just start off by a question. What are some things in life maybe that you just, you always want to have an overflow with? Think about that for a moment. What are some things you always want to have an overflow with? I, I was thinking about, you know, I always want to have an overflow in, of gas in my tank. I, I ran out of gas one time because my gas gauge didn't work, and it was in the middle of winter. <laughs> and, and I'm like, never want to run out of gas again. So now, uh, even Levi knows. Hey, he watches the gas thing, and when it says it's, it hits 100, he knows we got to go to the gas station somewhere under 100 right now. And uh, so both of our cars need gas today, by the way. I, I know that because I was driving them. Uh, both at the same time. No, not really. <laughs> but uh, so you don't want your gas tank ever to be that. If you're having breakfast with somebody, you, you don't ever want your coffee cup to get empty, right? <laughs> you always want that to be full. Uh, if you get hangry like me, you never want your stomach empty because uh, that's not a fun place to be in. And then finally, most of us know you never want to look and see your bank accounts empty. <laughs> that's never a good thing. And yet probably if you go through life, at some point in time, almost every single one of those things have been empty at some time in your life, and you've experienced not having the overflow in our lives. So if, if we were really to be honest, we never like to be on empty. We don't like to not have excess, and so we do everything we can to make sure that, again, we fill our tanks, we put money in the bank, we eat at regular intervals so that we don't run on empty. And I would say that that's pretty normal. Our idea of the overflow uh, is that there's always something extra. That's what we think of when we hear the overflow. Now listen, we, we take that idea into the spiritual realm with God. We, we really do. Like that's how life tends to work. That's how we want to approach life. And so we take that idea into how God's provision should work in our lives, that God is going to always be giving us extra. And that's, the problem is, is that the principle of extra is not what we see throughout the Bible. And that might be a shock to you, but the principle of extra is just not something we see. Don't misunderstand me. God does promise to provide for our basic needs. He he gives us that promise, and it's, uh, it's there through his overflow, but that doesn't always mean that there is extra or that there's extra savings in the bank or something like that. Understanding this principle is an important idea because a lot of people get off in their walk with God because they misunderstand God's provision for their lives. And so listen, one of the things that this idea does is cuts against the grain of how we naturally want to do life. We want provision. We want overflow. We want extra. And when we don't have that, we're not comfortable. And God puts us in that uncomfortable. I want to show you today and set this up how God teaches this principle in Scripture, in both the New and the Old Testaments. And so we're not going to, we're, we're going to just touch on two examples and then we're going to get into our story today. But let me t- start off with the Old Testament example. When God fed Israel in the wilderness, he fed them with manna. And he fed them with manna on a daily basis. So they had to go out literally day after day and gather just enough food for them and their family for the day. And if they stockpiled it, you know what happened, right? It it stunk, right? It, It rotted. It was nasty. They couldn't use it. And God was teaching them an important principle in their lives that, hey, listen, I want you to daily learn to depend upon me. That's the principle God wanted them to learn. Day after day, I'm going to provide for you, but just enough, and I want you to 
to, to really know that. In the New Testament, when Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray, most of you know in the Lord's Prayer, this little line that says, give us this day our daily bread, right? Jesus is teaching us to pray this way, and one of the reasons why is he's actually teaching us the principle that, was, that God taught Israel in the Old Testament, that he wants to provide daily the manner that they need day by day. And, and they wanted, so God is teaching us daily dependence upon God. And so generally speaking, though, the problem is, is that most Americans, we don't worry about daily food. We just don't. Most of us, what we worry about is, what do we eat tonight? <laughs> Not if we're going to eat tonight. We're trying to figure out what we're going to eat, and that's it. And so we don't really have this struggling uh, with our day-to-day -day eating needs. And so I think it's wonderful that God has blessed us so that we don't have to really stress about this in such ways. But oftentimes, again, that makes us struggle when we do have struggles in other areas of God's provision, and it's not this abundance overflow. It's not like we go to the refrigerator of our lives and there's an abundant stock of what food we want for this area and this area in my life. And so then we're not sure how God's going to come through, and we struggle with the overflow in that. So what do we do when sickness touches us and we just can't seem to get better? What do we do then? How is God going to provide for me in that situation? Or what do we do when we're looking for a job in we just can't seem to land the one we know we need and that one's not coming through and and we're not really finding that overflow or maybe it's your finances what do you do when month to month you barely make your your, your monthly needs and then they are wondering where is the overflow then i think what we find is that many of us struggle a lot more than we like to admit with God when there's not this abundance, when there's not this huge stock in our lives and we don't see this overflow of God's provision and we know his promises. We know that he promises to take care of our needs and yet we're worried about day-to-day -day things. And it's partly because we don't understand what his overflow means when it comes to our provision. And so I'm praying today that as we walk through this story, as we uncover some of these truths and principles that we actually see, not just in the story, but throughout the Bible, that we have a better understanding of what God is doing doing in providing for us, even when it doesn't seem like he's providing for us. Many of us are facing really a struggle right now to live by faith and to trust God and his promises. And, and I think like as we go through this, God's going to stir up and strengthen that faith so that you can trust God. So the story in the Bible that we're going to look at it's really this great story. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm captivated sometimes by the stories in the Old Testament because they're fascinating, they're interesting. But part of the problem with fascinating and interesting stories in the Old Testament is we miss that this is meant to teach us something. That they're just fascinating and interesting stories and we miss the principles that God is actually trying to lay out. And so the story that we're going to look today is about Elijah. And Elijah is literally one of the greatest prophets who ever lived in the Old Testament. And let me just start off with, again, the context of the story because it adds weight to the actual story we're going to walk through. When Elijah comes on the scene, when God calls Elijah to be a prophet in Israel, there had been literally 19 consecutive evil kings reigning Israel at the time. Okay, so we're not just talking about 19 years. We're talking about 19 consecutive evil kings who reigned about 200 years, and they were just one that got worse after worse after worse. And so this is who he is. Now, the evil king that Elijah is facing is a guy by the name Ahab. And Ahab marries a very wicked woman called Jezebel, who many consider to be the most evil woman to have ever existed. And if somebody ever calls you a Jezebel, that's not a compliment. <laughs> it's just not. So... Uh, in case you didn't know the Bible very well, <laughs> that's not a compliment. But anyways, so there, the Bible has this statement about Ahab. It says this in 1 Kings 16.30, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of these before him. Now let me put that in context. All these evil kings before him, guess what they were doing? They were leading the nation of Israel into idolatry, to serve and worship other gods. Part of that worship was sacrificing their children to the gods of Baal. So they literally were killing their babies and sacrificing them to the false gods. On top of that, a big part of their practice was engaging with prostitutes in the temple and calling that worship to God. And this is how wicked they were. And, and this is already going on. And the Bible says when Ahab comes on the scene, like he 
he creams them all. Like he's way worse than all of these and all of that is what's going on in front of them. And so God finally says it's enough. And once again, I want to point out that context. God's judgment comes after 19 consecutive evil kings, 200 years of warning them, hey, you guys got to get right with me. And finally, his patience is up and then judgment comes. And we sometimes, we don't realize how patient God is with us when we're in rebellion with him. But he is, he's patient, he's waiting. But eventually there comes this time where it's enough. And God steps in. And so in God, how he does it with, with Ahab is he sends the prophet Elijah to confront King Ahab. And the first time we see Elijah is found in 1 Kings 17, verse 1. And it says this, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tish, Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord lives, the, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. So he confronts them right away. Hey, listen, Ahab, there's not going to be any rain in this land until I say so, which may sound like not that big of a threat, right? Because you're saying, hey, guess what? I'm, I'm not going to let it rain. Well, who are you? You're not God, <laughs> right? But he is speaking on behalf of God, and he makes it very clear that he is God's mouthpiece who's declaring it is not going to rain. Now listen, this is a direct affront to the gods that Ahab is serving, because the God that Ahab is serving, is the God of Baal, is known as the God of thunderstorms. So God isn't just picking a fight and just making things up to go, hey, I'm going to hit them where it hurts. No, he's confronting the very gods they're serving and saying, your God can't even control the things that you say your God can control. He can't even control the weather. You think he can. You think you could serve him and you can find a way, but guess what? He can't. And so what's crazy is that Days go by, weeks go by, months go by, and guess what? No rain, no rain. And now Elijah is a wanted man. Now he's a threat. Now he is the enemy because guess what? He said, it's not going to rain till I say it's going to rain. And now he's backed it up with his words. And so here, here God has set up Elijah to confront him with this incredible word. And what God does with Elijah is kind of interesting. He, he takes him and he hides him away. Now, think about that for a minute. <laughs> you pick a fight with somebody, and then you go hide. <laughs> you look like a wimp now, right? <laughs> you look like, why are you hiding from the enemy? <laughs> and that's what God actually does. But he takes Elijah into the season of hiding, and, and he does this, I think, because he's, he's really trying to get Ahab's attention. God is giving Ahab a chance to repent. Listen, but instead of... Ahab recognizing what God is doing, he spends all of his energy on trying to find him and take him out. Instead of repenting, instead of waking up and realizing what God is after and trying to change his heart, he misses the point and he's trying to hunt down Elijah. So that's why God sends Elijah to the Kirith Ravine and where he's there, guess what? He has water. Now, what's fascinating is he not only has water, but God supernaturally provides him food by taking ravens who would bring him meat and bread every day. Listen, God is not a vegetarian. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he told the birds, bring them meat. And, and so he did. He fed Elijah with meat and bread every single day. Look it up. It's in 1 Kings 17. And listen, here he is. He's being provided for day by day, and God is taking care of all of his needs. But look what happens next in verse 7. It says, sometime later, the brook dried because there had been no rain in the land. So think about this. God sent you to the ravine to take care of your needs. He's been feeding you by the birds and taking care of you all this time. But now all of a sudden the brook's dried up. Many times I think we've been here, right? We went exactly where God had told us to go. It's been working out quite well. And then all of a sudden things aren't working out anymore. And you start to question, you know, did I miss God? God somehow maybe leave me here? And listen, here's an important lesson that we need to learn in our walk of faith about God's provision. God's provision is forever, but his method of provision is temporary. He's not limited to providing for our needs in the same way he's always provided for our needs. He has other ways of coming about doing that. And so God might give you a great job, and it's the one you prayed for, and you were in that seat for a season, and, and it was taking care of all of your needs, and then all of a sudden, a short while after, you're laid off. Or 
you're fired or a company goes out of business that you have been working for. God did lead you there. He provided for you with that. You heard from God, but that doesn't mean that God's going to continue to always provide for you in that same manner. It's hard a lesson to learn for us sometimes because, you know, we look at all these, all these circumstances and we can't figure out what's God doing? How is he doing this? Or why is he doing that? So we have the promise that God will provide for our finances. But sometimes he provides just for our food. We have the promise that sometimes he'll provide for the job, but sometimes he just provides when there is no job. God is not predictable in his provision. And the reason why is because he is interested in in us continuing to be driven to him to pray, to seek his face, and know that he is our provider. And we're driven to do that when we're not have this abundance and stockpile in the bank. We do that when we're daily dependent upon God. And Elijah is going to learn that the same God who gives water can take that water away. One of the reasons God may cause the brook to dry up is because we're too comfortable by the brook. We have no motivation to leave our comfort zones until God starts to make us uncomfortable. And so he dries up the brook to actually get Elijah to go where he's supposed to go. You see, if God didn't dry up the brook, it would have been harder for Elijah to leave. But God was giving him the courage to step out in obedience by removing his comfort level. And I just really love this about God because, you know, what, God, he, he's, he's helping us. You know, he, he's helping us get to where he wants us to be. He's not just saying, hey, go. He's actually helping us get there by circumstances oftentimes. The call of God in our lives is often hard, so we need those little pushes that God gives us, and he's willing to give us a little nudge. And so Elijah gets this instruction in verse 8 through 9. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. Now listen, there's two important things in verse 9 that I want to point out that uh, really are hard to swallow for Elijah when he hears these things. God tells Elijah, go to Zarephath. Well, there are a lot of things about Zarephath that would not be the ideal place to go, that God is sending him there, and, and Elijah wouldn't want to go there. Let me tell you a couple reasons why. The very first one is Zarephath is 100 miles away from where he is right now. It's a long journey. He doesn't get in the car and drive 100 miles. It's 100 miles away. That's at least a five-day journey walking. And so that's a long distance. On top of that, he's in Israel. And this isn't an Israelite town. This is a Gentile town. And so now he's leaving Israel, going to a Gentile town. And even worse, guess what this is? This is the hometown of Queen Jezebel. (laughs) This is her where she grew up. He's the enemy. They're looking for him. And now God's sending him to her hometown. It's also the center of Baal worship. It's the last place a Christian wants to be. It'd be like God sending any of us to Seattle. <laughs> okay, some of you didn't get that. <laughs> I was talking to somebody from Seattle yesterday, by the way, and it is not a good place for Christians to be. Let me just tell you that. So it, it would be like that. Like it was the last place in the world where God would put you where you'd be comfortable. And so, yeah, that is where God is calling him. And so the second little detail is that God's sending him to a widow who's supposed to supply for his needs. Now listen, we might not take that as being that big of a deal today, but a widow in that day was not a well-off group. Somebody who was a widow was really in a bad spot in life, and they didn't have a lot of means, a lot of resources. In fact, in Israel, the people were commanded to take care of their widows and orphans, okay? There was a special law in place so that widows weren't overlooked, and they were taken care of. And so this is a strange command for God to send him, though, to a widow who's not in Israel, who's in the Gentile nation, because guess what? The Gentiles didn't take care of their widows, The widows were literally some of the poorest people in the city. And so this is a male-dominated culture, and there weren't very many opportunities for women to work and to find ways of resourcing their lives. And so put these two things together. God calls you into your enemy's hometown, and his plan is for you to provide all your basic needs from a widow who can probably barely take care of herself. Sounds like a good plan, right? (laughs) 
And it's here that a lot of us get into trouble because God's ways are so contrary to our ways. They just don't make sense. They run against our own logic. And I mean, wouldn't it be smarter for God to send you to a rich person's house? That's what I'd be thinking. <laughs> Not to go to a widow's house. And yet God's sending him to this widow. And what we tend to do is instead of trusting God when he tells us to do things that seem so contrary to our logic, we go, I'm just going to go my path. I'm going to go my direction. I'll try to figure things out. Can I tell you, though, God has things figured out. And that's why he's sending you there. You don't have to try to figure out what God is trying to do. You just have to obey what God's telling you to do. And so if you think about it, ravens bringing you bread and meat doesn't make much sense either. But that's exactly how God provided for him. And sometimes our obstacle to trusting God when what he asks us to do doesn't make sense can literally just fall away when we actually just remember how he's moved in our lives in the past and he didn't make sense. Most of us have a track record of that. We have things in our lives that God did and we're just like, it didn't make sense. But he showed up and he did it. And, and we have that to point to times when God is asking us to do something that just seems unreasonable. <laughs> you're like, really, God? That? Okay. But, but, okay, but that wasn't reasonable either, and you've came through there, so, okay, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to obey you. And so Elijah obeys, and he takes this 100-mile journey, and as soon as he gets to the city, he runs into this woman. She's right outside the gates. Perfect, right? Timing. And then he finds this out. Verses 10 through 12. So he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. And so he called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me back a piece of bread. As soon as the Lord, as, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replies, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. And I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. God leads him right to the widow that is supposed to take care of him. And the first thing he finds out when he meets her is that she was making her last meal for her son. In other words, she's not only poor, she's completely wiped out with no hope for life anymore. But it's here that I think Elijah begins to get a picture. Oh, I think I see what God's doing here. I, I really do. I think God was, in, was revealing to Elijah, I'm not just sending you here for this widow to meet your needs. I'm actually sending you here so that you can meet this widow's need. God is doing both. He's going to meet Elijah's need through this widow, but he's meeting this widow and her son's needs through Elijah. And really, it's one of the keys to the blessings of God in our lives that God promised Abraham. He promised Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And the principle we see of God is when he saves us, guess what? We are blessed to bless. We can't lose sight of that. So if God is sending you somewhere, guess what? It's not just to be blessed. It is to bring a blessing to the people you're going to. And what if we could actually begin to think about that and to see that everywhere we go, minute by minute, day by day, that I'm actually here to be a blessing of God to the people that I'm meeting today. That's what God is doing in Elijah. And he wakes up and he realizes this moment, I am here to be a blessing to this widow. I think Elijah understood that because of his response. Look what he goes on to say in verse 13. And I know it can be misconstrued and we think, wow, that's a really selfish thing and harsh thing to say to the woman. But Elijah says this, don't be afraid, go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. I mean, at first you read that and you're like, what a jerk. <laughs> Like, you didn't even, like, want to have meal with them and eat together. You're like, hey, make me some food, and then after I'm done eating, then go make, make a meal for you and your son. Like, how, how can you do that? But listen, there is more to the context, because that wasn't the end of what he said. He gave her more in, that revealed this is kind of a test. This is a test. Am I going to believe the word of the Lord? Because Elijah goes on to say this, verse 14, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. 
So will you give God your first and then trust God with the rest? That he's going to take care of you. Will you do that? What, have, what, you, have, what you may not have seen to, to understand is so oftentimes whatever we place in God's hand is the very thing that he can use to bless us with. Even if it's little. And many of us, we, we minimize and we despise the little we have to give to God, but that little matters. Think about the story of the feeding of the 5,000. A little boy is asked to give up his lunch, right? For what? If he gives up his lunch, he doesn't just get to eat, but 5,000 plus other people get to eat as well that same lunch. God provided not only for his lunch, but for the whole multitudes, because in the hands of God, the little is multiplied. It is God's specialty. It is what only he can do. But the question is, is will we trust him first? Will we trust and put the little we have in his hands to see him then do his work of what only he could do? God gave a command with a promise. Hey, if you do this, I'm going to provide for you and all your needs. But the question is, will you obey? And that's really a tough one. Because here you are up against, trust what I can see. And what I can see right now is this. I've got a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. And if I, this is my last meal. Or do I trust the word of the Lord? First of all, make my prophet some bread. And I will not let your flour and oil run dry until the drought is over. What do you believe? What you can see or what's promised? And that's really a difficult to place to be in. Trust in what you can see and if you do that, guess what? You yield to death, right? Or put your trust in the promise and what do you receive? New life. God is often asking us the same question over and over and over again in our lives. The very first instance is the call to salvation, right? Call to salvation is, will you, will you trust me and, and leave your way of living, trying to get by on your own and do things your way, and finally surrender to me and let me lead you? If you refuse to and keep going your own way, what's that going to lead to? Your death, right? your spiritual death. But if you will yield to God and surrender to him and give him what you have, your life back to him, it leads you to new life. And it's the principle we see over and over in scripture. The Christian life is asked this question constantly. And many times we fail the test because we choose what we can see instead of the new life that God offers us. But there is always this test of our faith. Will you Give this up so that you can have the new life that I am offering you. The widow decides to put her hope in the word of the Lord. And she says this, and this is what we read in verse 15 through 16. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family, for the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Okay, there's the end of the story. It's a happily ever after story, right? <laughs> and we read that, and it all works out great. And the hard thing for us to remember is, is that each day was a step of faith for them still. They didn't know the end of the story. That's our challenge because guess what? We're not living looking back, right, in our story. We're living looking forward, not knowing what the end is going to be. And so we're not sure if, tomorrow there'll be enough. So we struggle because we want the overflow to be, well, the overflow, not just enough. And there's always more in reserve. That's what we want. But what God does is he has this woman daily have to scrape the bottom of the barrel to get just enough flour to pour out just the little bit of oil that's left in that jug and to make that bread each day. And each day it's used up. But tomorrow when she goes back to the flour bag, there's just enough oil and just enough bread or flour again to make more bread for that day. Sure, it's a miracle. They never missed a meal. They were always fed. But why did it have to be so hard? I mean, think about this. They had just enough daily, just enough. We always want more than enough. 
not just enough. And if we're not careful, we can get frustrated with God because often the Christian walk is God giving us just enough. Why does God often give us just enough? What does just enough lead to? Just enough leads to daily dependence upon God. Dependence on God doesn't come naturally to us. Do you know that? (laughs) What do we want? Independence. I want to be in control. I want to say where I'm going. I want to dictate the outcomes of my life. That is why we choose our way over God's way in the first place. But God often does what? He teaches us dependence. He is actually teaching us how to depend on him by placing us in situations where we have never, would have never chosen, where we have just enough for today, so we have to come to him tomorrow. That is why when we fight against this or get frustrated over this type of provision, we are actually missing the point. Can I tell you this? God isn't punishing you. He's teaching you. He's teaching us. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Paul came to a spot where he realized that depending on God's grace was greater than having his weaknesses removed. Why? It drove him to God. The one thing I think we often fail to realize is how God is using just enough to actually be a greater blessing than more in our reserves. I don't think we we realize that. But so often it is. Because at the end of the day, God has all we need. And you know what's funny is, is that's something great to say. But it's even greater to live that out day by day. And I think for many of us, there have been areas of our lives where we think, you know, God just, he hasn't blessed us. He hasn't blessed me enough. Because we're, we're barely making it. But the truth is, is God has blessed us greatly with just enough. We may scrape the bottom of the barrel day by day, but guess what? Tomorrow, he has another miracle for us. He's provided for us tomorrow and that there is another day that we can dip into that bag and there's just enough for that day. And so may we learn to praise God for the wonderful ways he leads us to be depend upon him because that's what he's doing in those times. Listen, as we close, you might find yourself hoping for more in some situation in your life. We all do. It's pretty natural. It could be your finances. It could be your health. It could be a job could even be more confirmation in the direction that God is telling you you're supposed to go. What we can trust is that God says, I'm always going to provide what you need. And he doesn't run short. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So listen, if your provision is not a supply problem, It is something else, right? God says, I have all you need, right? God's going to supply all that we need according to his riches and glory. There's no supply chain problem with God. He's got it under control. And I believe we can see that God is using our need to make us more dependent on him. There's nothing wrong with having more than enough. But sometimes God... He, he gives us that. He gives us more than enough. But we're mistaken if we think that when there isn't an overflow that we can see that there isn't an overflow. Sometimes God chooses to provide just enough for each day, and it's a principle that we see all throughout Scripture. And honestly, we're going to be happier if we begin to thank God and be content when we're in a position of, of daily needing a miracle and daily needing God to show up and give us just enough It is there that we can find that we're still able to live in the overflow of God's provision. The overflow of God's provision, therefore, is not about how much is in reserves. It is about God. It is about trusting God daily that he has enough no matter what I'm facing, no matter what I'm going for. And daily, he promises, my grace is sufficient for you. I have what you need. And it's a hard lesson to learn, but man, if we get it, if we understand it, 
that trust, that dependence, that connection to God will, will make us tight with God in a way that we have never known before. Because the opposite of, of God's provision is our independence again. And that's us doing things on our own. And that's not drawing us closer to the heart of God. And so would you bow your heads and pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for your word. And God, I know, Lord Jesus, our natural tendency, we want more, God. We think about the provision of you. There's just something in the back of our minds that provision always means more in our reserves, God. And yet, so often, the overflow of our provision is just enough that we need for this day, God. And I know that sometimes that's really tough to live out, God. But I pray that right now, that as we really contemplate on your word, that you would just stir up our faith to know God. That you haven't left us. That God, you're not punishing us. But God, you're teaching us to be more dependent upon you. And so I, got, I pray, Lord, that instead of fighting you, God, we would find a new joy and a new strength in understanding and seeing that just enough is more than enough, God. And so I pray that you would minister to our hearts and our minds and our spirits today, no matter what we're going through. Because God, I know that probably every one of us has something in our lives where we're just wishing for more. God, would you just show up and provide in this way in my life? I thank you for the story of Elijah and this widow, God, and all the things that you've done through their obedience, God, to show us that you are a God who will provide, that we can depend upon you. And that daily, God, sometimes that means daily. We, we get to see miracles. And God, may we not despise ever seeing the miracles of your hand at work in our lives. Listen, if you're here today and you've never experienced the greatest miracle in your life, which is salvation, which is the fact that God wants you to give him your life, and in exchange, he wants to give you new life. And if you're here today and you just feel this tug of God's spirit on your heart and your life to draw you to, to his heart, to a life with walking with him, if that's you today, could I just lead you in a prayer of just surrendering your, your life to God where you're sitting? Would you just pray with me? Jesus, God, I come before you, God, and I recognize that I've tried to live life on my own. I tried to do it my way. God, I found myself really just needing something more, God. There's this hole, there's this lack that only you can provide. And so Jesus, today, I recognize that that's you, that you want to give me new life, God. And I desperately need new life because if I depend upon me, God, I'm dead in my sin but it's through Jesus that I can be saved and get new life. And so today I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior and to live and to honor and to please you the rest of my life, God. Thank you for providing for my greatest needs. And Lord, I just dedicate my life to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that, would you let somebody know today we want to give you a Bible? and uh, the next steps in following Christ and to celebrate with you and rejoice over what God is doing in your life. And so please don't leave out without telling somebody today.